Amen. We're good, brother. What's happening? Another day in paradise. How about you? I'm doing well. Doing well. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, the show. This is uh, Unfiltered. We're gathered here on this Super Bowl Sunday, uh, trying to uh, give you some nice conversation before you go off to the uh, party. Right, Kenan? Yes, sir. And uh, Kaya is on here. Um, I'm just going to try to pull up, uh, try to work out this um, other monitor so I could see what's going on. How are you guys doing? How are you doing, Kaya? I'm good. How are you? Um, I'm happy to be back on the show and, uh, you know, have a conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been a minute, eh? Yeah, yeah. It's been a while. I've missed it. So. Welcome back. What about you? How are you doing? I'm tired, man, but I'm good. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, I'm just trying to see if I could get this um, on this other computer so I could monitor our, our conversations, but for some reason I might not be able to. So uh, what are you doing about a Super Bowl? Any, any grand prep? Nah, man, I don't even watch sports anymore, to be honest, like that. So you would, I wouldn't even have known the Super Bowl was the day if it weren't for everybody talking about it. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I imagine, um, Kaya, what about you? Are you into football? Um, I'm not big on sports in general. Football, I've never understood football. Uh, but you know, uh, I'm always for team spirit. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, I, uh, I, I love sports. Um, I haven't honestly paid a lot of attention to it because uh, my mind has been turned to a lot of other things. But, uh, you know, it's, it's always nice when you have something that you can just, you know, sit back and relax to. Uh, that's exciting that everybody's uh, sort of buzzed up about, right? So um, hence, hence my interest in the Super Bowl and all of that. But uh, we have a storm coming, so it's going to be interesting to see how that plays into everything. I don't know if the storm is affecting your area, Keenan. Uh, not really this time. We had a little bit about a week ago where we got a couple inches, but nothing major. And the day was mainly rain and snow, so nah, not really. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, we're here. We're all doing storm prep. We're expecting about the set between 20 to 40 centimeters or more of snow. So you can have that. Man. Definitely tomorrow is going to be, <laughs> we're going to be locked in tomorrow for sure. Uh, there's no question about it. So we'll see. Maybe it's great for the people who are having a big Super Bowl celebration. Um, they don't have to get out tomorrow, but uh, you know, we'll see how that, that, that plays out. So uh, thank you to all of our viewers, uh, everybody who's out there watching. Uh, join us if you want uh, and contribute. This is an important conversation. Uh, leave a message uh, of appreciation, like our show, share, and uh, we all appreciate your support. Folks, we're going to talk about uh, African History slash Heritage Month. How are you all feeling about it? Well, I don't know. I feel like, you know, every year it's the time of year where it's like the darkest <laughs> it's the darkest time of the year the coldest time of year at least here um shortest month of the year and so you know it's easy to feel kind of bummed out and to feel kind of pessimistic but you know in now as i'm getting older um and i'm starting to understand more about you know what it means to be black and what it means to be someone of like of african descent um i've been you know i've been enjoying all of the new reading material that's been popping up online and yeah i've just been enjoying learning new stuff i don't know i can agree with her uh it's something that you can easily become pessimistic about and find all the negative things that go along with black history month but um there's still a lot of information that's being shared people are learning and growing more in these 28 days than they do sometimes throughout the rest of the year so i'll take that positive and hold on to that mm -hmm. 
I, I agree with you both. And, and I think that's why I think we're going to have a good conversation uh, on this because, you know, uh, I have the perspective that there is a lot of uh, positivity around people gathering around this, rallying around this month. Uh, there is a lot of awareness that's being created. Um, and there is a lot to be um, proud and, and celebrate. Um, where I think it's important that we have these conversations is that we can get lost in all of the um, celebrations and all of the um, feel good moments. And we forget to have the conversations that actually should underpin a moment like this. Because we have one month out of the year where we, you know, everybody's tuned mm. to our issues and for good or bad reasons for, uh, to advance their own interest or not. So it's up to us to sort of boggle down and say, okay, yes, there's all of this positive energy. There's all of this um, hope, uh, but let us actually analyze and look at what is being celebrated and also look at what is not being celebrated and what is not being talked about and see if we can balance that conversation so that it's not just one of those feel good months and then we move along and then another year comes around and we're doing the same thing. That's the way I feel about it. Well, as I grow into what I'm now considered to be a, uh, an elder in our community, uh, I take times like this to correct people about the misinformation that we've been given for half a century with love, of course, because it's, it's easy to just, uh, hey, that's wrong, this is, that's stupid, that's crazy. But many people are just coming into the knowledge of trying to get to know themselves, to know their, their lineage, to know their history. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. So the one thing about whether we want to call it African or Black, Black History Month, that, uh, that slays me to this point is that many of us are, just, are learning that we did not all come from Africa by way of boats and slavery were already here. And that information should have should be shared more and more and more, not to take away anything from the motherland or from Africa, but to give us the understanding that we've been all over this world before any type of colonialism that we know of. And to understand that richness of our history so therefore we can claim what we have here. Because I believe many of the reasons that they told us that we came from Africa was a means to keep the ancestors of the slaves from wanting to claim the land that they live on. Would you hear the statement, go back to Africa? It's like, well, hold on, go back where? <laughs> wow I, absolutely that's a very very powerful point uh that that is very important uh, not just for historical purposes but for the knowledge purpose because often our history is being told especially i should say especially when you're in in the west and north america our history is being told from the perspective of slavery as the start point mm -hmm. most times and, and the reason we do that is because, and I understand, the reason we do that a lot of times is because we want to follow in line with this social justice narrative. So we want to lay down the problem and then lay down why we should uh, do what we need to do to fix the problem. But an essential part that is missing is the fact that, like you say, uh, African peoples were all over you know, this, this, this uh, land, call it the, the, the globe or the world, uh, long before slavery was being perpetrated. In fact, uh, there are accounts of African peoples, you know, if you look at, think about the Moors uh, who were in continental Europe, you know, doing trade and business and invested in the arts and culture and actually teaching Europeans. You know, um, a lot of African peoples or our ancestors, as we would say, uh, in fact, um, helped Europe turn the corner on the Middle Ages. <laughs> you know, or the dark ages, whichever one you want to call. And these folks were called the Moors. And, and there's a lot of history there that is not being talked about. We, we often, you know, kind of start from the point of subjugation, you know, where, where we were being subjugated. So I really like that point that you made. Kai, I'm interested to hear what you think. You know, for me, it's interesting. I hadn't really thought of it from that perspective of, you know, starting from where's the problem and then trying to, you know, add on to that, extrapolate other information from that that one root um, area or cause. I had always thought about it, um, at least for me, as kind of a Eurocentric lens at looking at Black history. And where does Black history begin? 
if we're always taught black history begins when Europeans start colonizing the African continent, when Europeans start having major interactions involving like the trade and sale of African people, of black people, then what we're really saying is black history isn't important until Europeans become involved. It's not interesting until Europeans become fully involved with the continent. And it also, it shifts, you know, our perspective of black history and what it means to be black so that it's inherently negative. There's inherently suffering, there's inherently trauma associated with being black. And it's seen as a pivotal part of being black, a pivotal part of being African to be involved with this suffering and trauma. And I think it's important to talk about, um, you know, it's important to talk about systemic racism and slavery. But I think that, you know, at least for me, black celebrating black heritage should be about, you know, celebrating triumph over those things instead of really having this lens of trauma, black suffering, um, and this kind of European gaze on, you know, what does it mean to be black? I'm not sure, you know, if that's, that totally ties in with what you were saying, but that's what it brought to mind for me. No, 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 I, I totally uh, uh, agree with, with the way you characterize it. And, and all of this, it doesn't have to have a perfect fit, but they all fit in, in certain ways. It's the continuation of our narratives. And our narratives are so many, right? Uh, but but, but uh, it's just how we, we lay them out so that people can understand the nuances that are in our narratives. For example, what I've seen recently being um, pushed out is this um, issue, and you touch on it, of let's stop focusing on black trauma. Like people, I saw people sharing movies and saying, hey, here are 12 movies that uh, you should watch about black um, or black identity or, or heritage or African heritage that is not necessarily focused on trauma. And I thought that was a good thing. That was a positive thing. Um, and, and I've seen people pushing out books, you know, saying, hey, read this book or read that book that um, doesn't really dwell on, on, on the trauma and all of those parts, uh, which is great. You know, um, I think we need to find a way to, to be balanced and to do it in a holistic way. Because one of the things, again, you, you hit the nail right on the head too often we let our narratives be dictated to us through this Eurocentric lens. So now, again, talking about this focus on not focusing on black trauma, a lot of the people pushing these narratives are not uh, people of African descent in any ways. Of course, it may have been started by somebody of African descent, but the majority mm -hmm. of people who are pushing it. So again, it's that every time we try to tell our stories, um, somehow, the powerful interest, the, the, um, the people who are more engaged uh, in, in, in promoting this uh, narrative through which, or these platforms through which we tell our stories, often have a way, whether they know it or not, whether they're doing it deliberately or not, kind of co-opt the narrative. And then sooner or later, it's just, you know, it's just something that's going viral. But is that really the intent of why we wanted to do that? So, so that's sort of the balance that I think we need to start applying ourselves to so that, you know, we're looking at it from a holistic point. What are your thoughts? Well, um, you know, I think that it's interesting also because I, I do agree with you that there is a time and a place to talk about everything and that talking about the whole story is really, really incredibly important. I do think that when we talk about his, uh, history in a way that's centered on black trauma, black suffering, that those stories need to come from within black communities or at least the um, direction on how we address those things and how we talk about those things need to be black focused. They need to be, you know, because oftentimes what I see is, you know, narratives are pushed that even though they may be well intentioned um, or trying to be, you know, progressive or sensitive to these issues, 
they're really not representative of the room. Um, and you know, not all black people feel the same way about everything or I'm not trying to say that, but I do think that those perspectives, perspectives on those kinds of things need to come from within black communities or at least be led by black people, those discussions. Um, well, yeah, to touch on a few things that you both said, one of the things you both mentioned is that we don't all share the same perspectives as what we're considered to be Black or people of color in this country or the world. But let's just keep it here and keep it westernized. Um, one of the things you also mentioned, you said you weren't sure if they were doing these things on purpose as far as the movies that they produce and so on and so forth, or whether there are even Black hands on these projects. Um, and it's funny because right before you said that, one of the things that came to my mind was how at one point our maps were different. If you're familiar with the Peters projection versus the Mercator projection, one of the things that has been done has been made to, made to all the countries where people of color come from look small and insignificant in trade routes, making the, the smaller co continents that are uh, European reign or I don't wanna say where they had descended from, smaller. So there's always been this seat. And one of the things I realized about 15 years ago when they opened the uh, Smithsonian American Indian Museum, which is derogatory in its own right by calling it the Indian Museum. But when you go into that museum, you don't really see it much, if anything at all, about Native American tribes previous to European co colonialism. It's almost as if like this museum is based around when we touched down, what we saw, what we witnessed of these people and how we tried to change them by putting them in school systems to basically assimilate them into a European ran society. So because we have been assimilated and our ancestors have been assimilated to this society, uh, there are a lot of things that we're all coming into knowledge at different rates at different times because we're not different. We're culturally different in, in this country alone from state to state, let alone between the United States, Canada, and the South America. We all have a very different perspective of history because it's been written by the victors. And even when you talk about movies, the one thing is uh, major mainstream Hollywood will not produce any movies about the times when we ruled Spain or the times where Manson Musa was the richest man on earth, they're not going to make those movies because one of the reasons that they have this perception within the movies and even within the maps or the museums is the way to keep us in our place. Because if we find the richness of our history of ourselves and realize that we can be great on our own, then there's a chance that we won't cooperate with their system very well. And they have to keep the foot on our neck in order for them to stay afloat. So there's a lot of deceptions and there's a lot of lies and there's a lot more that we still have to uncover as a people because all of us are coming into knowledge at different rates. And I want to say over the last 12 to 13 years since the, uh, the watch game uh, use of, uh, of smartphones, people have come into more knowledge through sharing through each other with social media and going over the internet on their phone than the previous probably 50. So, I mean, there was definitely a time when people knew the truth but it's been watered down. People were murdered for telling the truth. People weren't even allowed to read and write this language as it means to keep us from knowing the traps that were being laid for us. And then, of course, because of Hollywood, we have people who work within Hollywood, whether they're writers, producers, directors, or actors, who are being used as puppets to keep us in our place. For example, you can even look at a movie like uh, Hidden Figures, where the ladies, the three ladies who were responsible for helping the Apollo mission with NASA. And then they had to add a white character who didn't even exist into a role just to give, you know, the white audience something to, to associate themselves with more or less, but also to add a lot. And so if a lot of people are getting the information from Hollywood, unfortunately. Many of us walk away with memories of things that we've seen from movies and we hold on to that more than the materials that we read. Because some people don't read and don't read books that have been published previous to uh, the 1950s or the 40s, or even some books from the 1800s, you know, just to give you a clear understanding of what the world was like before European col colonialism. So we got a ways to go, in my humble opinion. But once again, to add to what you said earlier, Kaya, is that we're, to take the, the beauty of it all, we're sharing, we're learning during this month, sometimes more than we are during the course of the year. So we're waking up a sleeping giant. Uh, uh, Kaya, you want to jump in? Yeah, well, I was just going to say that I, you know, I agree that like media, I find for me, media has always felt like a way to really keep, keep me in my place or keep me, I've always found, I don't know, as a young Black woman, like as a young Black woman, my place in media has always been as a side character, 
and I'm sure that that's exaggerated for people because I know that I'm also privileged and that, you know, I'm not affected by colorism. Um, and so, you know, we see this shift away. I've noticed that we're seeing a shift away from all black women are the side character, the secondary character, the, you know, the companion piece to the white characters to now light skinned women like myself are put up on a pedestal and the dark skinned women are now in that role or continue to be in that role. And I just think that it's really interesting that you've kind of gotten into how media has been used to kind of keep black people in their place because not only within, you know, movies specifically about black struggle or about black trauma or black stories, but even just within, you know, your regular everyday TV show, you can see and you can pick out the way that black people are often represented as lesser or secondary characters, they're less developed. Um, and, you know, a lot of the time their story centers around racism and centers around the way that white people view them. Um, yeah, yeah uh, it, it's, uh, it's very, yeah, go, uh, uh, go ahead, Kinan. Sorry to interrupt you, but just wanted to touch on what she said about that, uh, that role. We can go back to coming to America. The, uh, younger, the younger sister who was the darker skinned sister who didn't uh, actually win over Akeem's love, she as an actress doesn't even like to have her name associated with that movie, which is why she's not even in the, in the, uh, the sequel. She took so much resentment to her role and got so much backlash from the black community for playing that role and watching the lighter skinned woman uh, get that role, It'd be the queen of Zamunda. And, and then you saw the one dark skinned lady who was in Zamunda who had to bark like a dog and hop on one foot. Mm. But that's not our model. We did not create the paper bag test. We did not see the different blends of our different skins, uh, skin tones until they made it a point for division. I mean, because you go across Africa, that have places that haven't been colonialized, you have people of different shades all over the place. And we can't say that that's truly attributed to, uh, to rape or either interracial dating, because ultimately, who carries what we call the EG, the black woman? She can have birth, give birth to any color, skin of child, any eye color or hair color. It all comes from our genetic code. And not to be obviously, as I told you before, I'm no way, shape, or form racist. I just state the facts. And that obviously, they're a mutation of the original people. Like someone says, oh, Yaku created white people. I'm like, so I guess Yaku was a bear too, and he created polar bears. You know, <laughs> it's just a natural mutation that comes from us moving to different climates and changing our, you know, our bodies to adapt. Um, but the other thing is that when it comes to the, those roles and that division that is being used against us with the skin colorism is that one of the things I really would love for us to touch on at some point is what is it to be black? Do we really want to even use that term? I try to refrain from using that term as much as possible, except for when I have to describe myself as someone who doesn't have the knowledge that I obtain. And that, first of all, that name comes from a, a negative connotation around death, even down to Necro or Negro. And even as we've changed in this country since the last 60 years, 70 years going now, we went from uh, colored to, to Negro to Black in a 30-year period. And whose choices were those? The, the gatekeepers in our community and it's it's a shamble so to say whether we're black whether or whether even like I told you before I don't consider myself to be African-American I know that my family is from the Americas and I'm Native American which I put on any type of documentation that I that I sign any, at this point because I'm not signing myself to be African-American because first of all it's a non descendable term you claim no descendants when you call yourself African-American legally and but, we got but, <laughs> Go ahead. But, very, very important uh, point. And that segments me to the next uh, thing that I'd like us to chat about is given all of what you've said, uh, what you talked about, uh, uh, how the media um, um, portrays us, which goes back to essentially the rich and powerful, because who are those who control the media? Who are those who control all of these means of production? The means of uh, the means and ways in which we, we, we tell our stories, we put our stories out there, the way people perceive us, it's not necessarily our communities who own that. So I want to ask the question, does it help that we operate within a capitalist system that has its own interest and its own, uh, um, it, it has its own aims? And so trying to fit in, you know, this, um, our history 
uh, with the retelling of our history in the ways that we want within a system that was set up to, um, you know, to, to, to make us less human and, and to marginalize and subjugate us. How does that work? I'll just, I'll just give you a little uh, uh, setup here. I, I was reading a book called Winners Take All. And this book was written by a New York Times, it's a New York Times bestseller. And in a sense, what this person was saying in this book is that, you know, the, uh, the, the rich and powerful, um, the rich and powerful in this day and age have now become, uh, are rebranding themselves to become champions for social justice and equality in every way and in any way, except the ways that threaten the status quo, in, except in ways that threaten their, their power and their wealth, right? So they, they, they can appear to be champions of the poor, except in the ways that threaten them. And, and, and that fits right into this narrative of African history month, African heritage month. Look at the way the corporate society embraces this. It's now a month where, you know, you have banks are gonna put up panels to talk about whatever they talk about. They're gonna put money into whatever to create that uh, promotion and ensure that they seem to be living up to corporate responsibility but again, these same institutions, whether financial, um, you, can, you know, pick any one of them, the big corporate institution. If you actually want to look at what it is that they really do in communities of African descent, uh, of black communities, to actually elevate people above the poverty line, to elevate people to work on an equal school as the rest of society, it's very minuscule. Compared to the but compared to the you know the amount of profits and all of the things they make, so are we just victims again of the rich and powerful uh, trying to you know use use us again in new ways uh, to to you know to advance their interest? I thought you were going to say something, Kyle. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say you know I think that. For me, I'm really glad that you just mentioned that because I was found that a lot of our issues, um, social justice issues in general, because I see this happen also with, you know, Pride Month. As soon as it's Pride Month, all of these big banks that are profiting off of the oppression of minorities, that are profiting off of these imbalances within our like economic systems, all of a sudden their, you know, their their whole building is rainbow for that month, and then that's it. Um, then they're, it's gone. Um, and there's no mention of these issues ever again. Um, and I think fundamentally, a lot of our issues of race and a lot of the things that we perceive as race issues are socioeconomic issues. Um, you know, people always say, oh, communism doesn't work. Extreme socialism doesn't work. And, you know, I don't, I personally don't feel that capitalism has ever fully worked for everyone either. Um, so there's something interesting to be said about the role that our system, our economic systems play in racism, especially a lot of issues that are associated with Black people that are supposed to be Black issues, issues of drug abuse, gang violence, whatever, you know, it is, a lot of those are socioeconomic issues. And so even looking back at slavery, that the driving force there is Socio, like even within our perception of race and our the way that because there's not really race is not really a science right as much as we may want to believe that there's clear racial traits it's not really a science and a lot of the way that we have come about or we've gone about creating our divisions in race has to do with maintaining structures that will help rich people particularly rich white people acquire money um, and, you know, keep others from acquiring those same resources. Um, yeah. Well, you're, you're hitting uh, uh, onto a, a huge issue. And I, I wanna also follow up with this. Think about it this way. I, I've been reflecting quite a bit and I think that we are almost getting lost in the symbolisms and, and, and I'm making this up, but, but it will make sense as maybe I explained. We're getting lost in the symbolisms of symbolism, right? It's like 
everything around uh, uh, black, black history, equality. Uh, uh, it, it, we, society has been driven through corporate interest in it, the rich and powerful focused on it as champions of social justice. We are being driven down a path where the symbolisms that are used to demonstrate that people are interested in these issues and want to resolve it are taking a greater precedence over the actual resolution of the issues. So everybody celebrates the symbolism and then we forget that the symbolism is only a symbolism. It's a literally uh, creation. It, it doesn't mean the real issues are dealt with. I'll give you an example. So now we have uh, Black Lives Matter is nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, okay? Good and fine, great. Stacey Abrahams, who did a lot of work in uh, encouraging uh, disenfranchised people to vote is equally nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. In fact, Donald Trump was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. So, but, but, but you see what I mean? So there is a huge celebration. Everybody feels so great. We're you know, all rallying up in arms. BLM is nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. What a moment. But we forget that the Nobel Peace Prize and the nominations are inherently political. You know, so whilst they are sending a message about that, if you want to ask what they have actually done, what are they actually doing to, to, to liberate Black folks, to relieve communities across the world of people of African descent, you'll find that it falls short. But this is a smoking mirror. You know, we're nominated for that. Perhaps they're going to win it. It's going to be great. Again, like we say, we're not being cynical. We're saying that, yes, it, it, it creates awareness. It, it, it's a positive thing. It's a positive moment. It's a feel-good moment. But let's not get caught up in that and forget that it's only a symbolism. Well, you know, I always say to people, uh, you know, for me, it doesn't, I, you know, you can write Black Lives Matter or have a bumper sticker on whatever you want. But for me in my everyday life, it's not, it's not changing much for you to just say, oh, I support you. If your actions aren't changing, then I'm just assuming that you're using me, which personally, personally, this kind of fake woke, this kind of like fake activism um, especially when corporations do it, no matter what subject. I mean, we saw those Gillette commercials um, against toxic masculinity when their company has been profiting for years and years and years off of, you know, an industry that is inherently sexist and inherently like encourages gender divides. Um, it, it just comes across to me as almost more harmful than you know, and, and I said, this is a little hyperbolic, but almost more harmful than, you know, saying or doing something racist because you're actively stalling progress. When you do something that is, you know, symbolic, but has ultimately no, there's no action there. You're, you're actively stalling progress. You're actively filling up space that could be used to do something productive and making it about yourself and making it about whether that's money or popularity. I noticed with the black squares, um, if anyone remembers Blackout Tuesday, that that particular day, there was no, I at least on my feed, I found no information about the Black Lives Matter movement. It was all black squares. So if you're trying to encourage people to you know, get information about police brutality, this is not the way to go about it, obviously. And anyone with common sense would know that. And I'm not shaming people who do it. I, I know that it was like, it was mostly well-intentioned, but what you're doing is you're not, you're, your thought process, it's focused on yourself. It's focused on your image. Um, and I find that I, I'm not a fan, so. Jumping, Kevin. So one of the things you say that as a uh, stalling progress, Absolutely right, but they're doing it on purpose. I mean, because at this point, what they're dealing with is uh, what they call order out of chaos, which is order out of chaos. So if you keep enough chaos going around the world, you don't really allow people to actually come together and group up and, and 
unite and be able to work against the system if you have people kind of scattered all over the place. Because let's say, for example, as people of color in this country, if we were to try to revolt against the United States government as a people, even with the help of white hands or Asian hands or uh, Hispanic hands, whatever you want to say, one of the problems that we have is, is that three of our strongest groups of men and women are in three different places. They're either locked up in jail, they're at their disposal in the military, or they're athletes, which are being controlled by their dollar sign. So when we say about Hollywood and the media and these uh, movie stars and even people who are just wealthy in this country from, from the education, you have people who are complacent in their wealth and in their gain that will never look down and help somebody who's below them, especially if they're directed not to. Because one of the things that's stronger than racism in this country is stay in your placeism. So that, that goes for white folks as well. One of the biggest tricks is that they, what you saw of the rising of the Proud Boys is that you had a group of white men and women who realized, well, we were told that this was our country. We were told that white was right. We were told that all these things that we benefited from because of our skin tone was going to advance us. But now we're watching black governors, we're watching black mayors, we're watching people in the White House. So you're lying to us. This is not made for us the way that we thought it was for. And they're rising up. The same thing can very well happen with people of color. But when you have us in so many different compartments, it makes it hard for us to realize who's on the right side of things. Because as a person who used to avidly protest in the streets of D.C., when I first heard of the Black Lives Matter movement, okay, at first it sounded great. Until I started really, you know, looking at the, uh, the semantics behind the words and, and even the slogans that they use on their website. When it says that they want to disrupt the platonic family and end the uh, male patriarchy, I don't see the benefit in that. I don't see the understanding of why that should even be pushed to the forefront when it says Black Lives Matter. Because ultimately, if you're saying that people of color's lives matter, then it should be it should address the many different goals that every different person of color wants to see as far as their considered freedom. But how do you get that? I don't know what you want to say something. Well, I was just wondering if you could clarify that point on the patriarchy because I know. I mean, I don't know. I'm not. You know. I've never really fully understood the language around the patriarchy. I'm not really fully like informed on that, you know, whole side of things. I do know that like, I found my experience as, you know, a, like as a female presenting black person to be different from people who present more with more masculine traits. And so I can see why that would be something that people would consider important to address when you're talking within black communities something that i've been trying to move away from is viewing identifying myself with someone or with a group of people just because they're black identifying with yeah. and deciding that i have you know that as a group we're all the same i've started to recognize more there's intersectionality within black communities and i think that's also part of like a white narrative is deciding that all black people have the same challenges. So I was just curious if you could clarify that because I didn't, I didn't quite understand it. Well, um, first thing, when it comes to the patriarchy, um, obviously I don't, I didn't create mankind. And hmm. if we look at different species, there are patriarchies and matriarchies in different species. It just so happens that for human beings, that we're, man, we're a male strong and ran society throughout history. Yes, there have been women leaders, there have been women warriors, but overall, if you had to take an army, they're going to be majority men. And to say to that when you want to end the male patriarchy, I understand if you want to end the patriarchy of black men or women, sorry, black men or white men who maneuver in, a, in this uh, westernized society, yeah, that's toxic, it's dangerous, because a lot of the times the things that we've been taught here in this society are harmful to ourselves. You know, you saw back in the 50s and 60s where white men were just slapping their wives around on TV and movies like it was nothing. And then you could also say that that may have been a time where that was in our community, but it really only happened after the, um, around the time of like women's rights and live movement because of the fact that there were a bunch of black women who decided that they wanted to go and work within the confines of what white women were trying to find their freedom for without realizing that we didn't have that problem in our community. And as we merged into their community, so did some of our problems as they flooded our streets with drugs and gave us alcohol on every corner. Our domestic rates went up. But these were not things that were in our community. And then you saw black women realize they were being used to be in the numbers game for the white women's live movement at the time. 
but because you one of the people, not you, but women wanted to group themselves with other women, it was dangerous and it divided our own communities. And the last part I'll say to, add, to make some clarification is that I definitely agree with you. We do not all share the same culture and belief system. Therefore, we should not all be grouped in. And, and I think it's impossible because if you take somebody from the from Florida, from New York, from California, from Nova Scotia, from Newfoundland, we're all different. We all have different ideologies, we have different diets, we have different makeup. Uh, but for a group that encompassed the whole movement under the banner of Black Lives Matter to make those their two strongest points on their website, the end the male patriarchy and in the Plutonic family, sounds like another like ulterior motive. Instead of saying we're doing this for black unity, doesn't sound like that's black unity because last time I checked, most people I know subscribe to the fact that a strong union would be either a male and a female and their children in order for us to survive, not to say that homosexuals don't have a place in, in the movement or in society, but ultimately we wouldn't thrive if we were majority homosexuals or if we ended the platonic family, our numbers in this country would go smaller. But I wonder if that's a Eurocentric way of looking at family and a Eurocentric way of looking at gender, because you know, in doing research around gender and sexuality and around men and women's roles, and I'm not saying this is across the board, but Pre, a lot of pre-colonial societies, specifically people of color, um, well, obviously it's pre-colonial, but um, their views on gender, sexuality, the way that we structure families, I mean, looking at a lot of indigenous um, family structures and how, you know, community, the way that communities raise people it's very different from the European standard and the standard that we've kind of set around the world and then you see you know colonialism comes in play and now all of a sudden different expectations surrounding gender and sexuality are seen as savage are seen as primitive and it's used as a justification to inflict terror on people of color and so i wonder if you know we're <laughs> i i always just wonder if we're we're straying further and further and further away from when we talk about black people further and further and further away from the way that black people have been living because we're we're deciding that what's ideal for black people or for people of color is these systems that are inherently european or you know have ties to um colonialism so uh I'll just jump in real quick to 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 bolster what you're saying in a in a in another perspective is this that if, if you look at our traditional societies like we were saying even back to the time when we black folks African descent folks traveled across the world so many inventions lifted Europe turned the corner in Europe help Europe turn the corner from the Middle Ages. We had universities uh, at the time when you know Europe didn't have. Uh, uh, you have the empires of Mali, Songhai, all of those things that have now been rewritten, not necessarily by us, but those stories have been rewritten from a Eurocentric perspective to to put this glory, but a distant glory in the past, right? Uh, of how society was structured and functioned in Africa. Talk about the role of women. But more importantly, to go to your point, Kaya, is this idea that now we have the capitalist system and the incentives that motivate the capitalist system run by the rich and powerful, majority of them white and Caucasian, who now incentivize thought leaders within our communities to write a certain, they reward thought leaders who write from a certain perspective Although it might be a social justice uh, perspective or lens, but the bottom line of that perspective is if it protects the status quo in the sense that it advances social justice, but does no harm to the wealth and power of the rich and powerful, then they reward these thought leaders. And then we take these thought leaders and we look at them as the models. And so then it goes to your point that we are still educating getting all the information from a certain lens that is influenced by a certain interest but we just don't know it because we're looking at the person who's 
the, who's writing and producing that information and say, oh, he's from our community, so he must be speaking for us. Yes. He's being rewarded and given a prize and being sponsored. And it goes the same way for, as you were saying, athletes, what do they promote? Are they promoting necessarily the interests of the community or are they standing for the money that is being paid to them uh, uh, rightfully earned by propping their, their, their celebrity of uh, actors, all of those things. So that is another perspective that fits right into that. And that's pretty much what I was saying as well. Maybe I didn't clean it up as well, but after you stepped in and what she said is definitely what I meant in the sense of, hey, I don't necessarily believe that the patriarchy or the uh, Plutonic family is what we once had, because we can go back in African history where there were men with multiple wives if they want to, but it wasn't just purely for sex. Because if we look at the numbers game on earth, there are eight women, eight women to every man. So there was a time of necessity, understanding that these women were using each other as sister wives and, you, and helping each other to raise the children, taking care of the land, doing all type of things. They were purpose behind these movements that now we would think of if I had eight wives and I'm just doing it because I want to have sex with eight different women. But that's not the case. And um, geez, I almost lost my train of thought. Go on. I and, lost so, my train of thought. and so you were, you were trying to talk about the point of the Plutonic family and how um, we were talking about the, the fact that uh, generally in our movement, sometimes like uh, um, the uh, BLM had used the Indian mantra I talked about the fact that they want to precisely so these are not our narratives uh, completely right. these are narratives that are being promoted to those people that you said are being in uh in charge of the group tank the people who may be the gatekeepers they're being told what to write what to promote and so yeah i'm definitely not with those type of changes because it doesn't even make sense to our own history previous to colonialism but uh we are being used because ultimately you can go back I, like i said when i was out there processing you didn't see black lives matter signs on every corner you didn't see them in stores it was almost frowned upon if you had one on your on your front of your place of work because it would alienate people that were coming to your businesses but as it became cooler over the last year now business is sending emails out you see it on, on storefronts because they're not worrying about running off business because now under this liberal hive mind if you don't believe that Black Lives Matter, no matter what the purpose is, then you're not accepted in this quote unquote society. But to take it a step further, one of the things that I read about a few years back by a white supremacist named David Lane, he led a group of uh, the KKK and, and other white supremacist groups into the belief that they were going to be replaced, not at the top, but right below the world, those who actually control this world by people of color as a means that we will be easier to control after years of oppression and then take out the Aryan white man. And this is something that they're actually playing their hands into because you're seeing it. You're seeing the pandemic to us when you saw Nancy Pelosi here in the United States wearing a dashiki. And then you could see the Black Lives Matter email that people are sending out from businesses. And then you see all the people working their way up in government. But I don't believe it's organic because I don't believe that you can really change this system from within. I don't because ultimately if they, they have armies and they have the money that they spend on the military alone, if these countries around the world were taken over by Caucasian men, by blood, sweat, and tears, in my humble opinion, there's no way that we're going to vote them out of their power or take them away from power without a hell of a fight. So what we're seeing right now is they're, 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 they're appeasing us. They're trying to keep us from rising up and taking what's rightfully ours by letting us have a piece of the pie letting us have a seat at the table. And then those of us who are in a revolutionary mind state of spirit have to either calm down or be, or be considered an outcast if you don't accept the fact that we're getting better and we're making it, we're having a bigger seat at the table now. I found it to be complete BS. Well, I agree with you that like from within, I don't think that especially within systems of capitalism, real change can be affected, like progressive change can be affected um, I even see it with like environmentalist causes where, you know, all of the burden is placed on the everyday person and there's no accountability for the corporations. There's no accountability for the politicians, um, you know, the millionaires and billionaires, the Jeff Bezos of the world. Um, and, you know, I think that fundamentally we're, it's, we're all functioning on this there's class division. I don't want to be like a class reductionist <laughs> yeah. no, you hit because I know people head. don't like that. But I think that like the ways that we divide class and the ways that we like some of the big markers for what class are you in have to do with race, 
um, socioeconomic status, uh, all of that, you know, how educated are you? Do you have a formal education? And all of those things play into, you know, race, what we would just, you know, call racism, sexism, all of that. But when you boil down to it, it's about class and it's about money and it's about, you know, who's higher up and who is allowed to have political power and who's not. So I even see like, you know, and again, I'm not saying that any of these people are like bad or I don't agree with their politics or, or that I do agree with their politics, but you look at, you know, the, the type of black people that actually make it really big in politics specifically are like the Obamas of the world, the Booker T's of the world or the Kamala Harris's where it's like, it's a very acceptable way of being black. It's a very white aligning way of being black. And not that there's anything wrong with that. I mean, I know that like uh, people have told me that I'm, you know, aligning myself too heavily with the white image, whatever that means. I mean, there's no way of being black, but you see a very specific kind of person with very specific motives gain power. Um, even looking at Kamala Harris, obviously representation is good. Um, not saying that, you know, black children or um, Southeast Asian children don't deserve to see themselves in politicians, but when we have someone who's being held up as you know the pinnacle of representation for black women and they've spent their whole career fighting black communities it's it tells you something about you know the way that we decide the way that we talk about race and the way that we talk about class absolutely you 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 hit you couldn't have said it better Kaya. and 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 those are the nuances and intersections that I think we abandon when we don't have these conversations and pass this knowledge, because then a lot of people and 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 a lot of people tend to look at this rosy image of oh we're celebrating um, African Heritage Month and we celebrate those 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 people you know we put up the pictures of of the Rosa Parks the Martin Luther Kings the Viola Desmonds. You know, all of these, these, these people who, for, for, for good reason, uh, created milestones, historical moments that changed certain narratives. But the, the fact remains that, are we going to continue to dwell in those narratives, which ever since those narratives, things haven't changed so much more, uh, we still have the same thing. So, for example, I asked the question, why is it that we would celebrate Martin Luther King a lot more than we would celebrate Mal Malcolm X? Why is mm -hmm. it that, you know, so, so there's all, if you go into the black communities, you see there are all these different parities of revolutionaries, you know, in different ways, which goes to your point. But because of the way the Eurocentric society or, or, or view of, of our communities, what they celebrate more and put money, because it all boils down to money, put money towards propping that image, we tend to, to, to fall, to gravitate towards that. And then the ones that don't have that money and power behind to back, though they may have spoken up for truth, we tend to let those falter. And so then what story are we telling? What narratives are we telling? Well, then also those narratives and imagery, and it's it doesn't align with who the person was. So we create, for example, Rosa Parks, we draw parodies, or not parodies, we draw similarities between Rosa Parks and Viola Desmond when really like each of those two stories are incredibly unique. So we have Rosa Parks and there's this narrative that, oh, she was on the bus one day and she didn't get up from her seat. No, that was actually very well thought out. It was planned. It was part of a bigger movement that was going on at the time. But there's this, we create narratives and imagery around people that supports whatever is comfortable, whatever is, you know, we don't wanna talk about how much planning and how much work went into the civil rights movements of the 60s. We don't wanna talk about how Martin Luther King Jr. experienced harassment at, you know, the hands of the FBI. We don't wanna talk about that kind of stuff. We wanna look at tweets from the FBI celebrating Martin Luther King Jr. Day. We wanna look at what is comfortable and what is appealing and we're not telling the whole story. 
But the question is, who is it comfortable for? Because when it comes down to this money that we keep talking about, we all need it, or at least some type of way of currency to exchange for our energy and time put in so we can pay for our bills and things that we want and need in this world. However, when it comes down to uh, what you mentioned earlier, as far as like the assimilation that we see in, in movies or even with our political activists or political leaders, it's all assimilation because you're right, as like you said as well, we're allowed to have different tones, different ways of talk, vernaculars, we're allowed to have phenotypes and be different. And I'm sure all three of us at, at some point in our life have been questioned about how black we are by either the, the things that we say, the music we listen to, the way that we dress or whatever it may be. And then forget that we still are going to go through that experience with somebody who's inherently racist, just the same. Um, but when it comes to that power, and that's what money really is, we can go back, like, again, I mentioned we talk about TV shows. Everyone loved the Cosby show, right? Up until Cosby's allegations. But at least most people, I don't want to, I can't speak for you, but one of the things that I picked up on from that show was, I'm like, I got family in Brooklyn. I got family in Queens. And not one of my family, uh, groups of families that I have in those areas or anywhere in this country have names like Heathcliff, Rudith, Theodore Aloysius was his name on the show. The Claire, all their names were nothing to say there's anything wrong with having a certain name for us uh, specifically, but it obviously is showing you that this is a way that they want you to be accepted in the society, not to have Afrocentric names, not to have creative names. Um, their haircuts were all very tame. Their looks were all very tame. So ultimately, when they give us these image, images from politicians or from movie stars, they're giving images that they're comfortable with. And I say that for the white elite that run our world. They, as long as we move and act this way, we're okay. But the moment we start to let our hair stick up and wear cornrows or wear locks in the military or in, the, or in some type of government job, then it's wrong. Because ultimately, they don't want us to really be, see, be our true selves. Well, I think also part of being your true self is also being okay with like, I always found that I was told that I'm not black enough. And I don't know if that's just because, you know, I grew up like, I'm a fairly privileged person, you know, you I've up? always been surrounded with white people. I've always been in like schools where I was the only black person. Um, but who are we letting define what is blackness? Like, if I speak in a way that you would consider to be grammatically correct or proper, is that acting white? If I speak in a way that you consider, if I act in a way that you consider intelligent, is that acting white? Why are we aligning only positive traits or what we would typically consider to be positive traits with whiteness and then everything else? Are we deciding? that you can't be black and also have your own personality also have your own traits also have your own way of living and being and operating within the world let me just i can stay because go ahead no 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 i, I wanted to throw this in before you, you, you speak is that and, and let's grapple with this for a little bit this whole notion around image uh, you, you touched on it but but imagery how we wrestle with the way we present ourselves You've had that in 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 in, uh, in 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 communities where we say we have a we have a like a game face, and we have a you know we have our at home face, you know. So so how 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 we how we decide to interact with the society and 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 create an image of ourselves out there in in the way we interact, um, and and also how that affects our wellness because. We're processing a lot of things. We're, we're trying to make sense of, of all of this history. We're trying to make sense of our reality, but we're also trying to make sense of how we navigate and move forward. And so we're, we're, we're constantly under this um, stress of trying to manage different components of our existence. And so, um, you know, it's, it'll be interesting to, to see how you, 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 you yeah, what views you have on this, you know, politicians most likely they talk about them creating an image. You know, you create an image of yourself as a politician and what you want to project out there. But for us, uh, as as people of African descent, as Black people, I feel like every time it it almost feels like you are also managing some, whether it's created by you or some imaginary image of what people project of what they think you are. 
and, and who you are and, and the things that you stand for out there? Well, like the, the thing is, is that it's because we're divided at this point. Some of us are benefiting from the assimilation tactics and some of us aren't. So we can go back to even with slavery, even though the narrative may not be completely true, but there was a time where they allowed people who were lighter complexion to work inside and the darker ones to work outside. So then you create resentment issues between that same community who come from the same tree. So if you have years and years of that slave mentality, house mentality working throughout society by those people who may be uh, come from privileged families who may be lighter in their skin tone uh, or grew up in a certain area demographically that benefit from the white society. And then there's a large amount of us who don't benefit from it. Therefore, they're mad at this one and we're fighting amongst each other. But like you said uh, about going to a predominantly white school, I started off in D.C. as a child and uh, my mom's in the medical field. So I, I grew up privileged, even if I grew up in a rather uh, criminally uh, drug Flow city when I was young and there was only black students in my school. I went to a Catholic school. Then I moved to Ferdinsburg with my father as the crime got too bad when I was 10. And I moved to an area that was predominantly white. I got called the N-word for the first time and I laughed because I thought it was more or less like, oh, this is this is cute. This actually happens. But it also changed my vernacular, the way that I talk, the way that I move. So when I moved back to DC at 21, all of a sudden I wasn't black enough anymore because I talk in a different tone. I use different words. I uh listen to different music or have piercings, you know what I'm saying? So it was just like, now it's normal, but it's uh, it's all done as a means of chaos, order through chaos, because once again, if we all united and realized that we were all struggling under the same oppression and the same banner, then we would do more about it. But we've seen those times, like, we, like I spoke to you before, we had Black Wall Street, we had our own bank, we had our own hospitals and schools, and they blew it up. Literally flew airplanes over and blew it up. And so and burned it from the ground as well. With that being said, they don't want us to progress, to go back to what you were saying about stalling progress. They just want us to be comfortable enough to spend the money that we spend in this country on sports, entertainment, clothing, and, and whatever we may spend our money on, but never, ever catch up to them. Wow. Uh, it's, uh, well, it's I don't, I've don't. always found... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, jump in there, Kaya. I was just going to say it's a really great uh, conversation oh, we're no. having. And just to uh, let our viewers know that uh, we are looking at a critical lens of, you know, African Heritage History Month, uh, the Black experience. And, you know, we're, we're doing a candid reflection of what that means uh, uh, for us uh, uh, in an in a inherently capitalist world. And, and so we're trying to navigate all these different things that are thrown our way. So when we talk about our experiences, there's no, clear, there's no clear lens that you can look at it from because there is capitalism that has its own role in it. There is, you know, the money and power's interest. There are our own unique uh, uh, tendencies that we have based on the experiences that we have that plays into it. And so it's really fascinating that uh, we're sitting here and having this conversation. Kaya, go in. Well, I, I was just going to say that, you know, I've always found that like the times where it's been easiest for me to understand my blackness or to understand that myself is when I've kind of walked away or stepped away from trying to be understood as black and trying to be like, I'm black, I'm black, I'm black, and trying to prove to other people that I'm black. Um, and I found that for me, like the most liberating way to celebrate my black heritage or whatever my African ancestry, whatever you wanna say, is to just enjoy life and to enjoy creating things and enjoy like navigating my own personal relationships and like experience that like black joy or, you know, whatever you wanna call it without feeling that pressure to like label myself because then you're, you are, you're putting yourself back, you're, you are purposely and intentionally putting yourself back into a system that's not benefiting you. You're intentionally, and it's not your fault, obviously. Like, I think that we're always kind of told because part of the, the painful thing about like soul searching or trying to understand your own identity around race is that sometimes doing too much of that can be really not a good thing. And so finding that balance of understanding your race, understanding your racial identity, how you want to identify, and then also not boxing yourself into that can be really um, interesting. It can be interesting. 
Mm. I agree with you a thousand percent. As a, as like I said, as the year that I went out there protesting and getting into uh, uh, social justice uh, stuff on the internet. I mean, I, and I didn't want to be one of those people who would just type on my phone. I'm like, I want to be involved. I want to go to groups. I want to do things in my communities, mentor people, and you name it. I, I just overexhausted myself doing that all by means of me getting this spark of information about my past or my people that I may not have been raised upon. So it can be, it can, a fire can be lit upon us, but you're right though. We have to be able to keep that fire from burning either the, the good parts of our existence away or boxing ourselves into this corner. Cause now once you put yourself in groups, when you join protest movements or deal with other groups, now if you don't move and act like them, then you can become an outcast. And that makes you want to stay in that box or a comfort zone. You may either have hundreds of people that you know have your back in the time of need and they all have all something. If I change my narrative, I now have on Instagram. I lost thousands of followers the moment I stopped posting things about black and black this every day. And the moment I started getting more into my, the spirituality of, of self and of this world, then all of a sudden I lost a lot of that following in those people. And I think that's what people have a problem with is that they want to belong to a group without realizing that you shouldn't lose your individuality in the process. Well, we come to expect that too, of people of color, like I think in general, we expect that like their role in society is to, to always educate. It's always to educate. It's always to be a resource to white people. It's always, or, you know, anyone in the LGBT uh, community, it's always their job to educate straight cis people like it's always the minority's job to educate um and just allowing people of color allowing minority groups to have their own identities and to form their own interests and to like experience and enjoy life is really really important for some people i think that does mean like getting involved and going out and protesting and writing articles and stuff like that i don't think that inherently makes you you know anti-black or makes you you know naive or anything like that but I think it's you know when it comes down to it it should be your choice um and you know when we don't afford people that what we're doing is we're just we're trying to be woke but we're really stripping people of color of their own autonomy and their own individual choice in their own lives and and uh, uh all of this uh culminates in the point that we, we are a very strong people. Uh, we are very mentally uh, forthright. Uh, we are very sound, we're very tough. And so um, we need to really protect our wellness and well-being in all of this. And that is why it's very important that, you know, um, as African people, as black people, as people of African descent um, with black heritage, knowing the historical trauma that we have had to overcome, uh, we have to do everything to ensure that, as you say, enjoy those moments, celebrate those moments of what our experiences mean to us, uh, that those, those Black moments, rather than trying to always fit into what society projects on us, because society is never going to stop projecting what it expects from us on us, whether they want us to be the equalizers, or to be the balancers, or to be the, um, the resource that educates about our experience, all of those things are going to always be projected on us. And society is going to use whatever tools they have in their toolbox. The rich and powerful are going to use their rich, their, their wealth and power to co opt our experiences to advance their interests. Uh, those who don't have money are going to co opt. Our, um, our willingness and ability to want to tell our stories and to want to inform others so that they know how to interact with us for their own interests. So it is up to us to ensure that we keep being authentic in the way that our experiences are viewed. That, that, that's uh, the way I see it uh, going forward. Well, one of the things I feel that we have to be uh, cautious of is that we've been led into this Messiah complex where we believe that there has to be someone or something to like save us from, from the day without realizing that even Martin Luther King, near the end of his life, regretted a lot of things that he was paid to do, basically. You know, when he came to the realization and said, I fear I've integrated my people into a burning house, they don't talk about that, Martin Luther King. But what's also not stated is that we keep on looking for celebrities and 
and looking for uh, social justice uh, figures to be leaders. We forget that it wasn't Martin Luther King who made everything happen or Malcolm X who did everything. It was the hundreds and thousands of people who believed in something that one they wanted to change. You know, we actually look at ourselves instead of looking at some greater person to be able to lead the way and show us the way. Then we realize it's, it's just the individual. It's us. It's all of us. But too many times we've been, we have to believe that, oh, Jay-Z is going to, supposed to pay all these people or that uh, some athletes supposed to build the complex and feed the poor without realizing that maybe we should just give up less than what we have or either really fight the terror in the system together. But because we have so many different people stretching our minds and projecting who we're supposed to be, it's hard for us to get to that united front because ultimately everyone's out here saying, I want to be like Kamala. I want to be like Obama. I want to be like Jay-Z or I want to be like Kendrick Lamar. You know what I'm saying? And it's like they're all still paid for opposition. Because as we say that imagery means a lot and representation matters, let's go and look at Martin Luther King's uh, museum in Atlanta, Georgia. It's not Martin Luther King's statue out front, it's Gandhi. <laughs> and that's because Martin Luther King spent too much time with the Maasai complex looking up and idolizing Gandhi without realizing that Gandhi was a damn racist himself. But we don't get that. We get revisionist history. We get what we're told, oh, Gandhi was a great man, but Gandhi would have called all of us a Kafir. Which will be the Absolutely. same thing as being called the inward things. Absolutely. So. Um, well, um, my friends, we're going to have to leave it there. I mean, we've uh, we've been going on, um, you know, uh, an hour and almost thirty minutes here. Great conversation, and I think we should continue it. Um, we shouldn't just have these conversations, you know, during this time. Although that usually is the tendency, because you know, we're always focused on so many other things that our minds also get turned around um, to focus on these issues around this time. But I think, um, you know, we have a great platform uh, here. We're all a part of it. And we should uh, try to continue to have these conversations and, um, and continue to just, you know, uh, be authentic in the way that we educate people about our experiences. Um, I think it's a good thing. So thank you all for coming and uh, for sharing your thoughts so candidly. And uh, I know next weekend we have um, uh, we have uh, Tongwa. Um, she's going to be here. She's an author. She's written a book on on wrapping gifts. Uh, she's going to be a guest. But it'll be great to have you, Kaya, on and, and Keenan, and uh, so that we can talk some more and. Um, I was going to ask you, Kaya, what does that, uh, the painting behind you, I know you're an artist, a visual artist too. Uh, did you do that painting? No, I didn't. It's a crime thing poster. I actually don't know much about the organization, but um, I actually got it at Storm. I think I talked about Storm on one episode. Um, yeah. And it's actually, I think it, it's on uh, on topic. It's, it's a long paragraph, but it's... Uh, basically the first line is it's convenient for those whose obedience is rewarded with status to moralize about playing by the rules so it's, it's talking about you know trust and in whose hands power power really lays so yeah guys it, it reminded me of uh the the book by france fan on that uh i think it's uh is it black skin white mask uh, but but it just reminded me of it because it's it's a it's almost like a black black mask uh, on the white skin. But anyways, yeah. that's an aside. Thank you all. Uh, I don't know if you have something final to say. Um, well, I just thank you for having me, and it was really nice discussing with you guys. It's really interesting. I have a lot of stuff to look up now. So. <laughs> all right. <laughs> All right, we'll leave it there and uh, have a great Sunday, you both. And uh, hopefully uh, you jump in next week, next weekend. For some more, it's still, it's still the month. So we're going to be talking about these issues until the end of it and beyond, maybe. Thank you. Right. Have a good evening. Thanks, Chibs. Enjoy the conversation with you as well, Kaya. Chibs, y'all have a great day. Enjoy the rest of your week. Okay. Have a good week. Have a good week.